Good afternoon and welcome to Washtenaw Community College's annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. It is my pleasure to be your host for today's celebration. I'm Dr. Eric Reed, Dean of Student Equity and Inclusion here at Washtenaw Community College. <clears throat> this year's celebration was put on by our Office of Diversity and Inclusion and members of the, and, and members of the Diversity Committee. So today, our theme for this year is becoming a beloved community. Dr. King popularized the phrase, the beloved community and re referenced it in many of his speeches. For Dr. King, the beloved community was not just a lofty utopian goal to be confused with the rapturous image of a peaceful kingdom in which lions and lambs coexist in idyllic har harmony. Rather, the beloved community was for him a very realistic, achievable goal that could be attained by the critical mass of people committed and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people share the wealth of the earth. In a beloved community, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and other issues will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will, re will be replaced by the all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. The core value and quest of Dr. King's beloved community was agape love, which he has described as understanding, redeeming goodwill for all. You can read more about a beloved community at thekingcenter.org. But as we begin, begin the process and meditate on our theme of beloved community, I encourage you to answer these few questions. What would a beloved community look like at WCC? What would there be more of? What would there be less of? How would we treat each other? How would people feel? And what would everyone have? <clears throat> As we strive to become a beloved community, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has planned a series of events to raise awareness of the systematic inequities experienced by returning citizens. That is individuals who've experienced our mass incarceration system. We are prompting students, faculty, and staff to further explore how we can enhance the life opportunities of our fellow community members. As you see, we have a long list of different um, items and speakers for today's celebration. Some of it includes a message from our president of WCC and US representative, Debbie Dingle, a message from student speakers, a special song tribute, and our keynote speaker, Victoria Burton Harris, as well as a presentation of our Equity in Action Awards. To begin our celebration, we have WCC student and Vice President of Students for Sustainability, Gabby Guyton Aguirre, with us to deliver our land, acknowledge our, our land acknowledgement which was developed by her, her and the Sustainability Task Force. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of the land and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Please welcome Gabby Gaitan Aguirre. Thank you. As members of the Washington Community College community, we humbly acknowledge that the campus occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of diverse Native people. The taking of this land was formalized in a process alien to Native cultures by the Treaty of Detroit in 1807 with the Anishinaabe, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and with the Wyandotte. Many other Native people lived on this land at different times, including the Swax, the Sauk, the Shawnee, the Kickapoo, Miami, Muscatoon, and Cherokee. Since the origin of the college in 1965, we have benefited from the use of this land where we work and study. And from its life, beauty, and spirit, we recognize our responsibility to understand and care for this land. And we honor with our deepest gratitude the Native people who have stewarded it for generations. 
Acknowledgement by itself is a small gesture, but let this step be an opening to greater public consciousness of our native history, sovereignty, and cultural rights, and a step toward equitable relationship and reconcilia reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, for both crafting our land acknowledgement and presenting it today. We believe it is very important to at least take a moment to recognize the depths owed to indigenous people as we do not take for granted the land that we utilize each and every day. Next, we will have our very own WCC faculty member, Gail Martin, who will sing a song in tribute of Dr. King. The song is titled Stand Up and it's from the movie, Harriet. Good afternoon. I chose this song because that's exactly what we must still keep doing is standing up. We cannot sit down at any point in time. You need to stand up and get your education, whether through a university, through life, combining the two. And as a faculty member, it's my duty to stand up for my students and to give what I all that I can give to the next generation. So I am my brother's keeper. I've been walking with my face turned to the sun, weight on my shoulders, ooh, and bullet in my gun. Oh, I got eyes in the back of my oh, to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Thank you so much, Gail, for that wonderful tribute to Dr. King. Um, if you're at home or in, in, um, in your office, please just give a, a silent round of applause. That was so beautiful and special. Thank you so much, Gail. <clears throat> Next, we will have a very special welcome from our very own President Rose Belanca. President Belanca, would you please come forward? Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, and welcome to everyone who's joining us for this very special event, honoring the legacy of a remarkable man who devoted his life to helping others, serving others, and leading the civil rights movement and building a beloved community. I'd like to recognize our board of trustees, our chair, our chair William Milligan Jr., our vice chair, Angela Davis, our treasurer, David Devardi, our secretary, our finance, our treasurer rather, our board secretary, Ruth Hatcher, and our trustees, Christina Fleming, uh, Dr. Richard Landau, and Diana McKnight Morton. Thank you so much for your support and your leadership. And last but not least, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Office of Diversity and Inclusion which planned this MLK Day celebration and other events this month. But they're all important. And I hope everyone has the opportunity to uh, participate. We have two very special guests today. First, we're honored to be joined by Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who represents the 12th district of the Michigan United States House of Representatives. And she'll speak in a few minutes. And I'm also thrilled to hear today's keynote speaker, Chief Assistant Prosecutor, Victoria Harris Burton. Thank you for being our special guests today. The theme of today's event is becoming a beloved community. Dr. King popularized this term and emphasized how important unconditional love and nonviolent approach the nonviolent approach, which I want us to remember, 
is important to achieve a world in which justice and equity is present for all. Today, his words are more important than ever. Indeed, Dr. The, Dr. the King Center.org's website continues to say, and I quote, embrace the conviction that the beloved community can be achieved through an unshakable commitment to nonviolence. I end that quote. As we strive to become a beloved community, we are engaging in a deeper understanding of the systemic inequities experienced by returning citizens, and we will explore and will continue to explore how we can enhance the life opportunities for our fellow community members. Dr. King outlined six principles and six steps of a nonviolent approach to advancing social and interpersonal change. And I encourage all of us to study them for ourselves. The underpinning, which really stands out to me, is Dr. King's commitment to truly love people. He called for the defeat of evil, not the defeat of people. I wanna repeat that. He called for the defeat of evil, not the defeat of people. Dr. Kim himself summed it up best in 1956 at a victory rally following a Supreme Court justice decision to desegregate bus seats. And I quote, the end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It's this type of understanding and understanding of goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of a new age. It's this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men, and I'd like to say women, and I end that quote. As we celebrate the life and honor the achievements and hold fast to the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I urge each and every one of us to take the time today to learn more about his vision of a beloved community and embrace his words and actions that are so very important. Thank you again for joining us today to celebrate the extraordinary life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And someone who's extremely extraordinary and supportive of a beloved community, a person who has stood for the rights and justice for all is one of our speakers today. And I'm honored now to introduce her to you, a well-known person that needs little introduction, but our Congresswoman, Debbie Dingle, to say a few words. Congresswoman Dingle. Thank you, President Blanca. And good afternoon to everybody. I wish we could be in person and I am yearning for the day that we can all feel that sense of community when we're together in the same room. But uh, I am, I'm gonna make you this promise today. We're gonna get through this and I'm hopeful next year we'll all be in the same room. But today we are gathering to celebrate a man whose vision forever changed this country and the world. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s advocacy for the principles of justice, equality, love, and joy inspired people across the country, regardless of race, to stand up and fight for a better, more tolerant nation. Today, I, think, I can't think of a more critical time to take a deep breath and talk about the lessons that he talked, taught us. We were just talking about community and love. And I, I today's just a, a, the timing of this year. Today in the House of Representatives, we are trying again. We just passed another vote on the John Lewis Act 
and voting rights. And today is a time that we celebrate the memory of Dr. King and how we have made progress. But as we pass that bill and in the times that we are in, that we are still living in a time of uncertainty and divisiveness. And I think it's harder than it's been in my lifetime to advance the ideas that Dr. King taught us. You know, I'm not old, I'm seasoned. So I, um, I actually was lucky enough when I was in high school to meet Dr. King. He was in Michigan. A lot of people don't know how much time he spent in Michigan. Uh, in his famous I Have a Dream speech was actually the first draft was written at Solidarity House, where the UA, home of the UAW. And he marched in Detroit before that famous march and gave that speech. But I remember being back in high school and he came and gave a speech uh, on open housing, actually in Gross Point, Michigan. And the nuns took me. They were worried that something was gonna happen. I to, to this day, remember they're telling me, if anything happens, that's the door and you'd be ready to leave. But what I remember that day the most is the hate. And there was some, some of, I felt the hate in that room by some, and I felt the love of Dr. King. The importance of her treating each other with dignity and respect, and that I had a responsibility to fight for that community and to fight for what was right. And in this world we're in right now, the fear, the hatred, the division, the anger, the vitriolicness that I am seeing too much everywhere is endangering us as a country. It is endangering the roots of our democracy. We are trying to take people back, not forward. And as young people, I'm begging all of you today to read Dr. King's words to learn from his life, but to know that you've got to help us bring people together. I never stop any day fighting for what I believe is right, fighting to continue to make progress. But I also know that hate doesn't win. I put my hand out to everybody. I try to work with everybody. And even when someone, and I've had some pretty ugly vitriolic things said to me in the last couple of years. I still, I keep trying. And I wanna close with some words of Dr. King's, which I think are as timely now and are something you really need to think about. Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. The aftermath of fight with fire method which you suggest is bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the love method is reconciliation and the creation of the beloved community. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, Love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies, is the solution to the race problem. And I would say to all of you, to the broader hate issue we're witnessing in our country today. Thank you. Thank you, President Balanca and Congresswoman Dingo for those beautiful words. Um, just to reiterate that hatred has no place in a beloved community. And Dr. King talked about agape love uh, very often and building a community of brotherhood and sisterhood. So thank you so much for sharing those words. <clears throat> now we have the honor and privilege of hearing 
from two of our own students from the College Recovery Program. Joshua Trushan and Jasmine Bryant will share their personal experiences at WGC and what a beloved community means to them. Joshua and Jasmine. Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joshua Trushan, and I'm a current student at Washtenaw Community College. It is an honor and a privilege to be speaking today. My journey towards this moment began approximately 10 years ago. I had recently withdrawn from my classes at the Wayne State University Honors College and was unsure when, if ever, I would continue my higher education. While dropping out of college and being uncertain of my future is not highly unusual, the circumstances surrounding my departure were far from the norm. At this point in my life, I was a 19-year-old heroin addict that had just completed my third round of inpatient substance abuse treatment. During high school, I fell victim to the common temptations that plague many teenagers during their developmental years. I began drinking at parties and smoking marijuana on a regular basis. I thought it placed me into a level above my peers, like I had found the secret to fully experiencing life. I was able to maintain a high level of academic success that helped me graduate as the third ranked student in my class. This enabled me to manipulate my parents and close friends while I rapidly developed into a full blown addict. I quickly became a victim to the mental obsession to continually use substances to change the way I felt. It was my escape. After a short period of time, I realized the gravity of my situation. I felt hopelessly stuck. The accompanying shame and guilt brought upon by my addiction caused me to avoid my issues instead of facing them. I was afraid to ask for help. I never once considered informing the university of my struggles for fear of judgment and repercussions. I simply ran away. Fast forwarding a few years, I had been left untreated, working a dead end restaurant job and feeding the progressive nature of my illness. To summarize my situation, I was completely controlled by my drug use. I was depressed, lonely, and playing a game of Russian roulette every day. This led me to a psychotic break in my so-called bottom. I gave in to my family's request that I attempt treatment again. I did this despite the fact that I truly did not feel like I could get sober. I began to put one foot in front of the other and took suggestions given to me. The treatment center encouraged my involvement within the local recovery community. I began to meet other like-minded individuals that felt the way I felt and struggled the way I struggled. I was amazed that many of them had been sober for a significant amount of time and were living seemingly happy lives. It was astonishing to me. The sense of connection and belonging that I felt within the community began to grow steadily over time. This happened simultaneously with my renewed self-confidence, spirit, an ability to love myself again. I started to become more exposed to people from all walks of life. Everyone shared different economic backgrounds, religious and political beliefs, and personal values. However, our common goal of sobriety helped to unify us and put aside these differences. I began to respect each individual person that I met and was able to treat them with the love and care that had been shown to me. I found that living my life focused on the spiritual principles found in recovery gave me a new perspective, a perspective that lines up with the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King's idea of the beloved community shares a similar mindset. Through nonviolence and love for our fellow human beings, we can attempt to create a world that is void of discrimination and focused on the common good for each individual person. As a public college, WCC has a responsibility to serve the local community while preparing its students for future educational and workplace opportunities. By implementing values of diversity and support for students, as well as teachers, WCC can continue to aim towards this ideal of the beloved community. I personally have felt this sense of community through my involvement with the Collegiate Recovery Program. 
The CRP program is designed to provide recovery support services for all members of WCC. CRP helped me to overcome my initial fears of going back to school while nourishing a sense of belonging on campus during the COVID-19 pandemic. I have been able to network with other students and faculty while pursuing my newly formed career and life goals. By receiving the support from Washtenaw Community College, it has helped me rid the feelings of shame and isolative tendencies caused by the numerous stereotypes that followed me during my drug use and addiction. I am now able to hold my head up high when I say that I'm a person in recovery. Additionally, my experiences with the various classmates, teachers, and other faculty have all created a welcome sense of care, compassion, and helpfulness towards one another. I have been fortunate to witness an adaptive learning community at WCC that strives towards its mission of making a positive difference in people's lives through access to educational programs and services. Looking towards the future, I have currently finished my application to nursing school at both WCC and the University of Michigan. I am striving to become a member of the healthcare profession in order to better serve vulnerable populations during these uncertain times. In doing so, I will be in a position to care for all members of the community at large with Dr. King's aspirations in mind, to treat one another with love. I hope that WCC will continue to build a culture of service to its members with a mindset focused on treating each individual with dignity and respect. I also hope that WCC continues to support the Collegiate Recovery Program. Not every school has a program like CRP, and I feel that it definitely has a place of importance in our beloved community. Thank you all for listening. Now I will pass it over to my fellow CRP member, classmate, and friend, Jasmine. Thanks, Josh. Hello, my name is Jasmine Bryant, and I am a student entering my second year here at WCC. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak at this Martin Luther King Day celebration. Over half a year ago, Dr. King spoke of a beloved community, which was not meant to be utopian, but rather a realistic, achievable goal that could be attained by a critical mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophies, the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. Um, in this community, Dr. King imagined that racism, all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. And this is the type of reception I have experienced at WCC. Like Josh, this is not my first attempt at higher education. About six years ago, I attended Wayne State University. While I was there, I participated in my education the way I had experienced most things, like an island. Early in my life, I learned about shame. Some of the people around me sought to point out some characteristics of mine they found undesirable, things like my complexion, mannerisms, and mental health struggles. The shame that I carried around, coupled with severe social anxiety, led me, led me to search for an escape. I found this oblivion in alcohol, so much so that I developed a physical and emotional dependence on the substance. However, I did not know how to be honest about the fact that I was struggling. As a young black woman, I felt that I was meant to show confidence and assertiveness because this is how that title had always been modeled to me. But eventually after suffering many of the consequences of isolation and addiction, I found myself in my first inpatient rehabilitation facility. But instead of being the miserable, lonely experience I was expecting, this facility showed me what it was like to be a part of a community a community where a group of otherwise strangers could share a particular love and understanding regardless of their race, gender, or age, much like the beloved community of which Dr. King spoke. After receiving some care and accountability from other like-minded people in recovery, I began to feel that I could do what I once thought impossible for me, go back to school. And when I arrived at WCC, my only plan was to obtain the degree necessary to get a career. Still, for some reason, I decided to attend new, the new student orientation, where the dean and several faculty members talked to the new students and explained what we should expect and our expect from our new endeavors at WCC and some of the many resources available to us. This orientation helped calm the nerves I felt about. Excuse me. This orientation helped calm the nerves I felt about going back to school. 
It showed me that I had a place at WCC, regardless of the many things for which I had felt ashamed. While I was in one of my first online classes, I noticed a teacher's link to a collegiate recovery program on his Blackboard page. And since I identified as someone in recovery while attending school at WCC, I decided to look for more information. And to this day, I am still a proud member of WCC's collegiate recovery program. This group works to remove the stigma of addiction and give a safe space to those continuing their education while in recovery from substances and other behaviors. It has proven to be a great way for me to keep my recovery in the front of my mind while becoming more comfortable working towards my degree. My degree. Because of my collegiate recovery community, I have the privilege of talking with you all today and sharing a part of myself with this school, a school that I believe shares a great deal of the same principles Dr. King represented. WCC has proven to be a school that strives not only to include, but celebrate the many differences for which others may have previously felt shame. Because of the warmth I have felt from my beloved communities of recovery and WCC, I am now striving to work with impressionable youth as a guidance counselor. I hope to pass on Dr. King's preachings to the next generation. And I hope that by showing love, understanding and encouragement to all young people, they may be able to grow up with the self-esteem necessary to continue building our beloved community worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua and Jasmine. Um, we appreciate your courage and your transparency in sharing your stories. Please, everybody, just give them a, a, a round of applause for doing that. That that takes a lot of courage and transparency. And uh, we thank the College Recovery Program for being here as a support system. A sole reason why we visualize becoming a be beloved community is to ensure Washtenaw is not only a place where every student feels welcome, but it's also a place where every student can thrive as well. So thank you for sharing those experiences. <clears throat> now, I'm extremely excited to introduce our keynote speaker of the 2022 MLK celebration, Victoria Burton Harris. Burton Harris is a Flint native and serves as the chief assistant prosecutor of Washington County. She holds a bachelor's in political science and African-American studies from the University of Michigan and graduated from Wayne State University Law School in 2012. Passionate about the relationship between law, social justice, equality, and equality, Burton Harris opened a private law firm downtown Detroit and specializing in family law and criminal defense at the state and federal trial court levels. Victoria represented hundreds of families across Michigan in cases ranging, ranging from childhood custody to mur murder. Her work has been featured on CNN, Democracy Now!, The Guardian, Essence Magazine, New York Times, and many other platforms. But after years of witnessing overcharging, requests for excessive bail, and prosec prosecutorial vindictiveness, Victoria realized that her efforts to become the people's lawyer would never be sufficient. Effective change will require transformation of the gatekeeper to the criminal justice system, the county prosecutor. Victoria is also president and board of the We the People Opportunity Farm, and is also president of the board of the Washtenaw Justice Project. Victoria lives with her husband, Robert, and three-year-old son, and their dog, Sasha. Please join me and provide a very warm welcome to Victoria Burton-Harris, our Chief Assistant Prosecutor of Washtenaw County. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> it is such an honor and privilege to be here with all of you sharing this virtual space. Um, I share the sentiments of Congresswoman Debbie Dingo uh, and wishing that we could all be together in person, uh, but that day is coming. 65 years ago, Dr. King spoke the words, love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. The aftermath of the fight with fire method, which you suggest is bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the love method is reconciliation and creation of the beloved community. 
Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies, is the solution to the race problem. 65 years ago, and I ask, what have we done with those words since then? I respond with a resounding, not enough. We have a thriving criminal legal system that responds to violence with violence, responds with retribution instead of empathy and sustainable solutions. There is no justice in our criminal injustice system. It thrives and operates exactly as it was designed. It swallows marginalized people alive, never letting them go. Even when one thinks that they have been let go from the criminal legal system, they live a life that is marred with judgment, roadblocks, and limitations. The criminal punishment system does not let one go. It feasts on the bodies of black and brown folks, poor folks, and that's exactly who it was designed to capture. Just as our black bodies were captured for enslavement in this country, snatched from the beautiful shores of Africa and packed into the bottoms of ships, throwing overboard any unfortunate soul that couldn't survive the horrific conditions. It is estimated that between 1.5 and 2 million black lives were lost during the Middle Passage. Those of our ancestors who did survive, they were brought to a stolen land as a stolen people. And they fought hard to hold on to pieces of their identity. They were forced to create many new cultural practices through their enslavement. And that wasn't easy. They fought to hold on to their identity while having to navigate the dangerous waters of survival. Survival during slavery, survival during Jim Crow, survival while fighting for their civil rights, survival during the war on poverty, survival during the war on drugs, survival during the era of mass incarceration, survival during the movement for black lives, survival. Black folks are fighting to survive and have done so without interruption since we landed on the shores of Jamestown in 1619, 400 years ago. We have had leaders like Dr. King live and give their life for us to stop fighting for survival and to coexist as a beloved community. Dr. King, he admirably promoted nonviolent resistance. He understood that violence is not an effective or a sustainable response to violence. Yet that's exactly the system of justice that we have in this country. A country that meets violence with more violence a country that was founded on violence and racism, a country that believes a person who commits a violent crime will be rehabilitated if they're thrown into a cage and treated violently by guards and other incarcerated people and treated like an animal. The words yard, child, block, those are all words that are part of farming terminology. Don't you find it troubling that the language used to discuss and describe incarcerated people is the exact same language originally used in the capture and maintenance of farm animals? Doesn't that make your soul weep that human beings are treated in that manner and expected to come out rehabilitated and nonviolent? We are perpetuating violence and not at all responding to it in a way that keeps a victim of violence from committing violence against someone else. We know that hurt people hurt people. Why are we not choosing to respond in a more holistic and loving way to address trauma and harm in our community in order to move toward a more beloved community? We know the answer to that. We as a society have been taught to fear our own people, to hate our own people, and to attach privilege to differences. We have chosen to not value all people as we love to profess as a nation. We have chosen judgment over empathy, violence over peace, and hate over love. But we don't have to. 
we can choose to honor Dr. King today and every day and practice agape love. None of us are winning right now. For as Dr. King said it best, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When there's injustice on the east side of the county, that means there's injustice on the west side of the county. When the rights of one group are trampled on, it means the preservation of all of our rights is in danger. We cannot afford to think in terms of us versus them. We are all we have, the beloved community. In order to actualize Dr. King's dream of a beloved community, we must reject the same old ineffective ways of change. We must let go of this idea of reform, for we cannot reform something that is not broken. Instead, we must dismantle and rebuild. What we do as human beings to value the lives of other human beings matters. Do we truly value each other for our differences? Do we value redemption and second chances? Do we value healing? These values were never a part of the building blocks of this country, but we have an obligation to build the world we want to live in. We have an obligation to disrupt the intentional continued attack on vulnerable marginalized people by being intentional with our combined power as a people. A power that when realized, it can impact the lives of families in our communities for generations to come. We have a unique opportunity with the newest generation of freedom fighters. This generation, y'all, this generation, like those before it, it's hungry and desperate for change, but they're fighting for equity, not equality. This new generation of freedom fighters are continuing the work of those who came before them. And they are doing so with an unapologetic boldness that does not back down nor compromise. They are coming for everything our ancestors said we deserve, fairness, freedom, an opportunity, an opportunity to raise our children in clean, safe homes with running water and food on the table, an opportunity to live in neighborhoods where gunshots don't tear through the walls of the living room inches away from a baby's playpen, an opportunity to walk the streets of their community without the fear of harm or death, an opportunity to live, to thrive, that's what our young people are fighting for today. And that's the work we should all be supporting. Our community is fighting for restorative justice, a healing justice that holds people accountable while they make amends for the harm they've caused. Our community is fighting for black and brown people to not be disproportionately represented in our criminal legal system. Our community wants true justice one that treats all folks the same, no matter the color of their skin or the depth of their pocket. We have an opportunity to reshape and redefine our society. We have an opportunity to change our criminal legal system. We have an opportunity to expand our capacity for empathy, love ourselves, love our fellow man, and build the beloved community we all deserve. We need to fight for people, all people, to be recognized as human beings and not forever defined by a moment in time. For we know that we are not defined by the worst thing that we've ever done. We have value. We all have value. Justice is so precious because it's not guaranteed. We must work for it, fight for it. This work is urgent. We have lost too many and we don't have any time to waste. All we have is each other. This pandemic, it's taught us many things. One of them is that we are all connected and depend on each other for survival. All we have is ourselves, our communities, our will to be better and righteous fight to correct the wrongs of our past and create a more equitable future. 
We will one day answer to our children, our grandchildren, when they ask what we did, how we responded to this moment of social and racial unrest amid a pandemic. We will have to answer and explain the role we played in the largest social movement in American history, the movement for Black lives. Will you be on the right side of history? Will you demand and contribute to building a more equitable and just community, a beloved community? For too long, generations of families living on the margins have suffered because of the way our communities uplift and support the operation of our parasitic criminal legal system. We must answer for the years of violence and ineffective punishment that has been our criminal system. We must first acknowledge that the criminal legal system has failed, been cruel and destroyed families and communities. We continue to see black lives unjustly taken, violently taken at the hands of the government with impunity. When we depart this virtual space today, I want each of you to leave here with a renewed sense of passion for justice and equity, a dedication to fight for marginalized people. I want each of you to ask, what can I do in this moment? I want each of you to rise to the occasion and play your part to the fullest in the fight for Black liberation, in the fight for Black lives, in the fight for equity for us all, in the fight for Dr. King's beloved community. Dr. King worked tirelessly to save America, as we like to warmly and comfortably say. He worked tirelessly to make a better life for us, our children, our communities. Communities that have been seen as a threat since we were stripped from the motherland and brought here to build this country. A community that is loving, beautiful, gifted, and determined to live, to survive at all costs. A community that has never taken no for an answer. A community that has demanded freedom, justice, and equity for 400 years and will not cease until we receive it. Y'all, we are all connected. When you invest in my education, my mental health and quality of life, you're investing in someone who lives in your community, who is able to meaningfully contribute to make good decisions and not take from the community. Starving a community of resources, of access, of power, solely because of the color of their skin, it's morally reprehensible. This has all happened on our watch. Our society has tolerated and many times supported the intentional marginalization of communities of color. Communities seen as not deserving of anything more. Communities not seen as valuable. We have a duty to act. We have a duty to love. I truly believe that our country is experiencing a reckoning as we shift to more progressive, more inclusive ideals that will help us achieve equity for all but it is up to us where we go in this moment. And in the words of my sister, Ashada Sakura, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Burton here. That was powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, thanks so much for just shedding light on our criminal justice system and um, how our endeavors to creating a beloved community, how we can do that for our fellow community members who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time and presence with us today. Um, I'd like to mention to everyone that uh, Victoria Burton Harris has decided to donate her honorarium to a community organization known as Supreme Felons. 
Um, Supreme Fellows is a nonprofit in Washington County aimed to amplify the voices of returning citizens and enhance their well being. Today, in the audience, we have um, the founder of Supreme Fellows, uh, Billy Cole, and then we also have the current president, Brian Foley. Um, thank you all for being in attendance with us. Um, a dynamic organization has done some great work in the community. And um, once again, let's just say thank you, um, Ms. Burton Harris, Victoria Burton Harris, our chief assistant prosecutor. Just a round of applause. <clears throat> All right. So now, as we get closer to the end of our program, I am very delighted to announce this year's Equity in Action Award recipients. The Equity in Action Award recognizes employees from Washtenaw Community College or a member from the surrounding community that has made outstanding contributions in areas of equity and inclusion here at WCC or in the greater community. This year, we have three recipients of the Equity in Action Award. We have two WCC staff members and then one community member. Our first recipient of the Equity in Action Award is Bayina Jackson, Assistant Director of Financial Aid Operations. Her nomination stated, Bayina's work with students often flies under the radar. She's a supporter of underrepresented groups, but mostly advocates for, for those students who, due to their social and economic status, may need extra help or accommodations to navigate the financial aid process. While many financial aid regulations impact our most vulnerable student, she always looks for solutions to make the process easier for them by removing underlying barriers whenever possible. She does everything within her power to create an environment that will enable success for the students she helps. Congratulations, Bayina Jackson, on your Equity in Action Award. And if we can spotlight Bayina, and if you wanna wave and share just a few words of thanks, you, you um, have the time to do so. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the college and the college community. Of course, my wonderful director and nominator, Lori Trapp, and most importantly, the entire financial aid team. It is a great accomplishment to, see, to receive this award, not only for me, but for my entire team. In the financial aid office, we strive to ensure the students still valued as an integral part of the college community. This sometimes means going the extra mile for some of the most vulnerable student populations, which we always do. A long time ago, I set a standard for my career to always ensure my leadership and my advocacy was something that I could be proud of. Being recognized for this award means that I'm doing the right thing, I'm on the right path, and I'm getting the goals that I want to get accomplished done. I intend to always be an advocate for students that may have trouble advocating for themselves. My goal is to create an inclusive environment for all students to ensure not one is left behind or alone while attempting to navigate a degree in higher education. The Equity in Action Award is something that both myself and my team can be proud of as we continue to strive and offer WCC students service that creates a positive community that reaches across the college. In closing, and in the words of the great Martin Luther King Jr., not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And in the financial aid office, we will continue to serve WCC students with pride. Thank you. And congratulations once again. Our next Equity Action Award recipient is Anthony Williamson. Director of College and Career Readiness at the Park Ridge Community Center and Harriet Street Center. His nomination states, for 20 plus years, Anthony Williamson's contributions to the community have been unparalleled. Anthony has a heart of gold and passionately is driven to uplift the voices of those who, who go unheard and provide an opportunity for those who go unseen. In many respects, Anthony, Anthony is what would someone would call an unsung hero for his works of all underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. A great deal of his work rested in Eastern and Ypsilanti, in Eastern Ypsilanti, um, in, in the side of Eastern Ypsilanti. 
overseeing both education and enrichment programming for students at Park Ridge Community Center and Harriet Street Center. From resume workshops to providing computers for economically disadvantaged families, he continues to demonstrate his care to help those struggling gain a, gain a leg up and improve their standard of living. Congratulations to Anthony Williamson, Director of College and Career Readiness, Readiness at Park Ridge Community Center and Harriet Street Center. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this award. As many of you know, I am a talker, but not a speaker. But today's panelists just made me really value the uh, depth of this award. So first of all, I wanna thank my Park Ridge and Harry Street Center team, because although for many years I've been considered the face, but this does, work does not uh, get completed without our team. I also wanna thank uh, you know, my leadership from Washington Community College. It took support from our board, our president, and um, the many directors I had, but most importantly, my current director, uh, Brandon Tucker. Uh, Mr. Tucker has really allowed me to grow in the way of directing and overseeing programs. So we are now scaling up the good work that we've always done. Um, I've been saying uh, for the last year or so that this is my way out. I have seven years left for when I'm supposed to retire as far as the numbers are concerned. But I want these last seven years to be the best work I've ever done. Um, as, uh, Vic, as Victoria has spoken about the need for improvements in our community, the, what I have always stand behind or stood behind was education. And I believe that these next years are going to be very, very important and impactful as we scale up our young people. So that group of uh, young people who are now um, destined to make these changes, because I do believe there's going to be some changes that happen. Um, and, and that change is on the way. I am hopeful that I'm here to see that, but it's definitely on the way. So on behalf of my Washington Community College team, the community that I support and love who have adopted me, because I'm a native Detroiter, but I've been in Ypsilanti for 30 years, and this is my home. I just want to thank uh, everyone for this award, and especially Lauren Tom. Lauren, who nominated me, I didn't know what he was nominating me for. He just said, I know you don't like doing this, but I'm nominating you for something. And, you know, hopefully you get it. So I would definitely want to thank Lauren because Lauren and Brandon has really proven to me um, how important the good work that we do uh, is important and necessary, but also has um, sort of um, lit an additional fire under me to say, hey, you know, there's a lot more to do. You've been doing the great work, but, you know, we're in overtime now and we have more things to do. So thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah. congratulations to me. Thank you and congratulations once again. Now, our community recipient of the Equity in Action Award goes to Melvin Parson, Executive Director of the We the People Opportunity Firm. <clears throat> I believe this short video that I'm going to share of the organization's financial report, report can explain more, the more powerful impact that Melvin has had on the community more than any words that I can express. So we'll play this short video um, briefly, and then uh, I'll, I'll let Melvin have some words right after that. The We The People Opportunity Farm second annual report. We are an organization that is committed to growth, rooted in justice, courageously disruptive, intentionally collaborative, and radically inclusive. Our mission is to break the cycle of incarceration and our motto is changing the soil in the lives of those we come in contact with. 
Several years back, I came up with a vision to create a world-class farm. But now, as a result of many conversations and much introspection into We The People Opportunity Farm, I find myself guided to create a world-class organization as well. We have two programs. What I want to report on is our formerly incarcerated paid internship program, which was hugely successful in 2021. Five great individuals in their own way, each became an important part of the organization. Although two left early, they're both on pathways to success. In alignment with our values, we increased our interns' wages by $3 an hour. We felt that a higher wage would increase our interns' chances for establishing financial stability. It was an honor to watch intern Lojean Darby go from living in a motel and catching the bus to the farm to securing stable housing, buying a used car, and towards the end of his internship, achieve full-time employment. We were thrilled to see another intern, Pony, take a big step by purchasing a moped. Keep in mind, this person had never had his own transportation. We watched with admiration as he showed up to the farm every day on his bicycle, rain, sleet, or snow. Lawanda Hollister was an incredibly tenacious intern, navigating two jobs, college classes, and her very first time in driver's training. And as a result of a generous gift to our organization in the form of a car, we decided the best use for this gift would be to pass it along to Lawanda as she continues on her path of reintegration and entrepreneurship. Our second program is our no-cost food distribution. Here at We The People Opportunity Farm, we realize that everyone's soil can be improved by eating healthy food. This year, we grew over 14,000 pounds of organically grown produce and gave nearly 3,000 pounds to our community, more than double what we shared last year. And the sharing is not a one-way street. Every greeting we receive during distribution strengthens our community bonds. Speaking of community bonds, we had many volunteers join us to work on the farm throughout the planting, growing, and harvesting season. Folks also helped with installing fencing, planting seedlings, and spreading compost and wood chips, and also helped with our fourth annual Harvest Festival of Thanks event. Volunteers were an important part of our organization this year. I am grateful for their joyful participation and the great enthusiasm they bring to our organization. The success of our programs and We The People Opportunity Farm as a whole is promoted by the collaborative relationships we have with our community partners. These relationships show how solidarity is a powerful tool to change lives and change systems. Grace Fellowship Church House of Solutions continues to be an important partner as the leaseholder of the center of our organization, the farm itself. This year, the progressive and forward-thinking leadership at Grace Fellowship consented to some structural additions on the farm, including a beautiful signage, a tool shed, a tomato cooling station, as well as an irrigation system. Habitat for Humanity gives our interns the opportunity to volunteer by working on some of Habitat's local construction projects. We feel this is a great way for our interns to connect with people and to give back to the community. Our interns also participated in career pathway workshops through Michigan Works. We were excited to have Yen Azaro create a beautiful welcome sign as well as a sign to declare that kindness and dignity lives here. Our interns came alongside Matt DeMond, owner of Ferro Floral, to help plant a pollinator garden donated and designed by Matt himself. Paul Ristich and his pals helped us build a tomato cooling station, which was of great benefit during our tomato harvesting. Thanks to David Tier, we now have an awesome new tool shed, and Green Things Farm Collective helped us install an irrigation system a critical piece of equipment to help our plants flourish and free up time for us to get other work done. I can tell you, these upgrades have had a tremendous impact on productivity, efficiency, and aesthetics. 
Once again, we had many great local restaurants purchase our produce. These include Maiz Mexicana Cantina, Bellflower Restaurant, Zingerman's Roadhouse, Zingerman's Deli, Detroit Street Filling Station, Frida Bedita's, Juicy Kitchen, York, Ricewood Barbecue, and Benology. In addition, our produce could be found at the Ann Arbor People's Food Co-op, the Ypsilanti Food Co-op, and at both Argus Farm Stops. We also want to thank the Farm of St. Joe's and food gatherers for purchasing our produce to distribute in the community. All of these local businesses support our mission and we want to support them. So please frequent them if possible and enjoy all they have to offer. Progress at Congratulations once again, Melvin. Um, that was for everyone. That was a short video uh, of short video that can be found on um, uh, We the People Opportunities for our website and on the YouTube channel. The full video is 12 minutes. We just play, played a portion um, along. If you go on further in that video, Melvin also talks about um, some of the goals for next year. And some of those, just to mention, are raising the wages of the interns, providing uh, benefits packages for the interns, and then also developing education partnerships um, for the staff and the interns. So thank you and congratulations, Melvin. And if you wanna just share, say, say, say thanks and, um, and wave and everything, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, uh, I'd first like to thank Christina uh, Herbin for nominating, for nominating me for this award. I feel uh, uh, really honored to be uh, alongside of Anthony and Baina accepting this in honor as part of the uh, Washington Community, Community College's way of honoring uh, MLK. I, um, I remember starting to attend Washington Community College back in 2010 and the only reason, you know, in all transparency, the only reason I went back to school was to get some student loan money. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and while I was there racking up debt, uh, uh, I met some amazing folks and instructors and, and got surrounded, as, as Dr. King would say, by a beloved community in ways that kind of just held me until I could find my path. Uh, education-wise, and, and that path led me to transferring to Eastern Michigan University, where I wound up getting a bachelor's degree in social work uh, as a result of someone saying to me while I was in one of Washtenaw Community College's amazing um, skilled trades program, I was working towards being a welder, and uh, one of my mentors told me that I needed to go back and get a bachelor's degree in social work and help somebody. And so I just kind of took that path there. Um, I, you know, I feel like I'm a lot of things. I, I feel like I am a, I'm a returning citizen, uh, spent 13 years of my life off and on incarcerated. Uh, but I'm also a father and a grandfather and a friend. And, 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 and I'm also a champion of social justice and I'm a firm believer as I tell people often, either you've got a seat at the table or it's your ass that's on the menu. And, and, and I somehow or another found my way to the table uh, in essence. And, and, and my goal is to, is to bring as many folks that look like me to the table as possible in, in many forms and fashions as I can. Um, I, I just wanna say again, a huge round of applause to Victoria Burton Harris, uh, you rock, you, you, you're so powerful and dynamic and, and community driven. And, and, and as she mentioned earlier, we are fortunate, my organization that I started, We the People Opportunity Farm, we're fortunate to have her uh, as our board of director president. And so uh, I'm inspired in, in in the possibilities of our organization moving forward to continue to help people change the soil in their lives. Um, I sit here today with you all as a result of standing on the shoulders of a whole lot of people. And 
and I'm honored to be mentioned in the same breath uh, on a day uh, that celebrates uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, thank you. Congratulations once again to each of our Equity and Action Award winners. Um, these are the awards that you will be receiving. Uh, we'll get this to you shortly um, after within the next week or so. So congratulations once again, and please everybody give another special round of applause. So we have one last award before we close. Um, our Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Diversity Committee believe that this individual deserve their own category of an award um, for their you know, passion, their commitment and years of service in Dr. King's legacy. We would like to congratulate Rachel Barsh on the recipient of the Leading by Serving Award. Um, one of Rachel's colleagues mentioned, as many people at WCC know, Rachel is the backbone of many of the college's institutional events. To name a few, they include 9-11 Remembrance, Welcome Back Day, Financial Fitness, Cultural Heritage Events, and for many years, the MLK Celebration. Without her being a part of those events and playing a role in countless other events, WCC simply would not be able to impact as many students, staff, and faculty as we do. So this award is just a uh, small token of our appreciation. I personally will say thank you for you know, all the years of service and the work you've done um, and everything behind the scenes and you know, just leading the forefront. And this leading by serving award um, is just a, a small token of our appreciation. And it definitely is very fitting for the work you've done through the years. So thank you and congratulations, Rachel. I can't talk, sorry. I had no idea this was gonna happen. <laughs> I'm used to being behind the scenes for a lot of reasons, but I'm really glad to be um, standing shoulder to shoulder with all of you and this beloved community. And thank you, Eric and Christine. I'm so glad that you're a part of this Wolf Pack. And um, it's our duty to go out and act in love and let's do that. Congratulations once again. So this is the award you'll receive, Rachel, um, pretty soon. Uh, we'll get this to you very soon. So you are very well deserving, like we said. All right. So as we get ready to close, um, I have the pleasure of introducing my esteemed colleague, um, Christina Doe. Um, Christina, she just started in her role a few months ago. Many, everyone knows Christina. Um, I am just so pleased to work beside, beside her. And I know she's um, not going to mention this, but um, because she's very humble, but if there's any credit for today's celebration and any of our events, if there's any credit you should give, it should definitely be to Christina. Christina is the backbone and the leader behind um, a lot of these events. And um, although today was virtual and then many of our events that we had planned this month, although we aren't able to do them now, we are postponing, postponing them and we'll do them in the future. But um, she just has some amazing um, ideas that we'll see throughout the rest of the year. Um, very detailed oriented and a lot of the things, even the pictures that you see um, on a lot of our uh, websites and everything. So thank you, thank you, Christina. I'll say it from the bottom of my heart for today's celebration. And Christina is gonna close us out uh, for today's ceremony. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Eric. Um, hi everyone. And uh, thank you for spending some time with us today to honor Dr. King. Um, I hope that our program has provided um, some reflection uh, substance for reflection and renewed your passion to take action as well. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge everyone at WCC who contributed behind the scenes to make this event possible. Uh, thank you so much to student activities, media services, conference services, facilities, marketing, the diversity committee, and the collegiate recovery program. Um, 
I am so thankful to all of our speakers for being a part of today's program, um, especially um, our student speakers, um, Josh and Jasmine. It was truly an honor and a privilege to work with you um, and to have you share our stories, uh, share your stories with us. Um, it's incredibly brave and vulnerable uh, to do that, and I thank you so much. Uh, congratulations to all the Equity Award winners, um, Equity in Action Award winners as well, and um, to Rachel, who has um, provided so much support to us throughout this transition um, with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion um, hosting this event, this annual celebration for the first time. Um, and I um, I'm also thankful to President Belanca, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, and our keynote speaker, Victoria Burton Harris, um, for being here today to share their words of inspiration. Uh, now I'd like to introduce my teammate, Mia Lanier Durkins. Mia is the first ever um, coordinator of student engagement in our Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We can spotlight Mia so she can say hi and introduce herself. Thank you, Christina. Christina took the lead on this event, working extremely hard to ensure this program was perfect and that it indeed was. Great job, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. What an awesome program. Attorney Burton Harris, thank you for all of your hard work in our community and we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Congratulations to all of our award recipients. Your work is truly appreciated and valued in our community. Again, my name is Mia Lanier Durkins, and in my role, I will engage current and prospective students into some of our student success initiatives here at WCC, including the HBCU Pathway Program, CTE activities, and more. I'm excited, excuse me, I am excited to be a part of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as the WCC community, and I look forward to working with some of you. Again, thank you for attending, and remember, it's going to take all of us to establish the beloved community Martin Luther King Jr. fought for, we're still fighting for, and that we deserve. Have an awesome evening. Thank you, Mia. Um, Mia and her role will be engaging current and prospective students into some of our student success initiatives here at WCC, uh, including the HBCU Pathways Program, CT activities, and more. And speaking of more, um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has a few more events next week that we'd like to invite you to. Uh, next Wednesday, January 19th, is our MLK panel discussion. Um, so this solution-oriented virtual discussion will center uh, the voices of returning citizens and focus on what actions can be taken to enhance opportunities for our fellow community members. Our panelists include Baraka Sanders, Lawanda Hollister, Anthony Williamson, and Jose Reyes, and this discussion will be moderated by Dr. Kimberly Jones. And on Thursday, January 20th, we will host our beloved community lunch. Lawanda Hollister of Chow Hall will be gracing us with her culinary talents and providing lunch to go for the first 100 lucky people. Lunch is on us, but all we ask is that you pay it forward by taking action to build the beloved community. And before we end, I'd like to share one last quote from Dr. King for your reflection. Our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. We look forward to putting our values in action and building the beloved community with you all. Thank you.